This is your Tech News Briefing for Tuesday, October 25th. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. The chip industry is in a period of transition. Intel, which reports earnings later this week, has been hit hard by a recent softening of demand for semiconductors. But the company has also had some recent wins, including the passage of the bipartisan CHIPS Act. That'll pour about $52 billion into expanding domestic production of chips. And Intel is betting big on U.S. production, with plans to build foundries in Ohio and Arizona, as Western companies look to break their reliance on Asian supply chains. Intel CEO Patrick Gelsinger kicked off our Tech Live conference yesterday, speaking about this and more with WSJ editor Thorold Barker. Here are highlights from their conversation. Hello, everybody, and Pat, welcome to Tech Live. Thanks very much for coming to be our first speaker. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So for the last few years, we've read endlessly about the shortage of chips in the world and not being able to get enough for cars and other things. That seems to have now flipped into a different situation where there's an excess of chips and prices have have come down and and you've had some pretty tough, tough earnings. You've been in the industry a long time. Is this a chip cycle or is this an economic recession that you're looking at? Well, obviously, chips are super important to the planet, right? You know, it's why we saw the Chips Act, why we saw, you know, all this uh, discussion around uh, chips uh, broadly. And, you know, the expectation is by the end of the decade, the chips industry approximately doubles. You know, today about 600 billion by the end of the decade, 1.1 trillion, right, in that view. So you clearly have a growing industry long term. So fundamentally, we have a long term growth cycle in front of us and we have near term wild cycles, right? Obviously, you know, the COVID induced cycle where sort of overnight, right, we saw supply chains disrupted. So supply decreased by five ish percent on an industry that typically is growing by 5% per year, 5, 6% per year, and demand went to 25% per year. So all of a sudden you see this huge acceleration in demand, right? Decrease in supply, disruptions in supply chains, right? And I'll just say the overstimulation of the economies around the world. And clearly that was most accentuated in the semiconductor industry. Well, now we're catching up. Right. You've seen the economy slow down around the world, supply chains for the first time. You know, So it really is one of those cycles. But it's against the backdrop where the industry is going to double this decade. So we have to keep building those long term factory build outs, even though we have to make near term adjustments and price variations. Right. And dealing with you know, Shanghai port shutdowns and so on. It's been a pretty dramatic uh, you know, a year and a half. So you've been in Washington a lot, helping to push through the CHIPS Act, how reliant is Intel now on subsidy going forward? First, let's contextualize the CHIPS Act, right? And we have the US CHIPS Act and the EU CHIPS Act. You know, if we were building manufacturing in Asia, you know, the expectations and SIA estimates say it'd be 30 or 40% cheaper if we were building in Asia. Supply chains are now firmly consolidated there. It is simply economically uncompetitive to build in US or Europe. And that's why we saw the industry move from 80-20 in 1990 in US and Europe to 2080 today. You know, it's been a dramatic shift over the last 30 years. So the CHIPS Act was balancing, you know, essentially leveling that playing field. So your strategy would still have been the same in terms of both the design and the production of chips, you'd have just been doing it somewhere else. Absolutely, it has to be competitive. When you're making that level of investment, it gotta be competitive. So a lot of this is about China. Can you talk a little bit about what your view is on the latest rules out of the Biden administration to stop technology transfer, both in terms of the technology itself and the people doing that? What is your take on this? Is this a good thing? I think it was inevitable, right? You know, and, you know, this view of how something so critical to every industry, every business, and are we going to, you know, be able to continue to have leadership on uh, those uh, technologies. Part of the reason I've been such an advocate for many of these uh, policies, I viewed this geopolitically as inevitable. And that's why the rebalancing of supply chains, you know, is so critical, right? You know, are we gonna have the supply chains that we need for our autos, you know, for our AI, for our national uh, security, for our game consoles, for our PCs? But when you were lobbying for the chips that, were you also pushing for this? No, no. But you're you're welcoming of it. Yeah, I you know, clearly yeah. expected this uh, to okay. be the case. You know, it's part of the reason that I've always used the phrase geographically balanced, resilient supply chains. You know, Taiwan plays such a critical role you know, for the technology supply chains, but it's precarious. 
even the Taiwanese vendors believe deeply they need their supply chains to become uh, more balanced. So, you know, I view this very inevitable, right, uh, as we look to the future. And given that, you know, none of the policies that are, you know, being put in place, well, I don't think any of us should be surprised by that. And just quickly, what is the gap like now between Chinese capability and Western capability? Yeah, today, you know, the most advanced in China, right, is about 14 nanometers uh, today. You know, different, different estimates. Uh, today, you know, we're doing uh, seven nanometers, about to do four, right? TSMC in Taiwan's about to start their three production. And, you know, we're racing to have our sub two nanometers uh, by uh, 2025. You know, and the policies that you've seen are basically to maintain or increase that gap between where China is, right, and where U.S. or European capabilities uh, would be. Great. Thank you very much, Pat. All right, that's it for today's tech news briefing. Tech Live continues tomorrow. For live coverage of the event, visit our website, wsj.com. And journal subscribers can get a complimentary online pass at wsj.com techlive. I'm Zoe Thomas for The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for listening.